This morning, we're going to have an extremely important final topic. Of course, later on, we'll have the Dublin Declaration, which uh, a lot of you have already picked up there. A big next step in a trajectory that has started four conferences, four forums ago. The forum is actually a very constructive set of events where people actually get together and they move. There are movements. This morning we're going to talk about, we all know that all the most important investment to get to universal health coverage, we have been reiterating this for the last four days, is investing in human resources for health. And we also know that the mobilization of resources for human resources for health is substantial, but it's also very beneficial. Now, because it's substantial, we need to mobilize resources for the Human Resources for Health agenda. We're going to talk this morning with a few very experienced people about creative ways in which already, as we speak, countries are trying to do this in creative manners. Now, in this audience, there's probably a lot of people who are also busy with that agenda of how to mobilize resources for the Human Resources for Health agenda. So I hope that you all prick up your ears because we'll have a conversation here first, but then afterwards we will be coming to you because this forum has been very much about thinking creatively together. So even in this final panel about finance, we're going to do that. So I would love to call to the panel here a few very, very important guests. I would like to start with the new ADG for universal health coverage and health systems, Dr. Naoko Yamamoto. I'd like to have a warm applause for her. For those of you who have visited Japan over the last decades, uh, Dr. Yamamoto is, is not um, a stranger. She has been, for many, many years, very much involved with the UHC agenda already in Japan. She was one of the people driving that agenda in her roles as Senior Assistant Minister for Global Health, for instance, and other um, administrative, high-level administrative roles that you had in your country. We're very, very honored that you could make time. She's, she's very new on the job. Like many of you know, the ADGs were just appointed a month ago. So she's going around like a whirlwind to visit uh, many, many people. But we're very happy that you honor um, this forum also with your presence because we know how committed you are to this agenda of human resources for health. So uh, welcome to the panel. Then I would also love to invite uh, Dr. Bernard Nan. Nalen is probably, I might mispronounce here. Another very, very senior health systems person who has been very much involved with the agenda of um, malaria research. He's currently involved with the President's Malaria Initiative, um, has been working all over the globe, um, been based in, for instance, in Kenya. He's been senior technical advisor to the coordinator of this um, program, but is now currently the deputy coordinator of the President's Malaria Initiative uh, in the USA. So we're, we're very, very honored also, Dr. Leyland, that you're here uh, with all your experience of how to invest globally um, also in the human resources for health. Now, as the next honorable speaker, uh, we have somebody that many of you have already seen because he's been very active also in other panels. Uh, Dr. Abdurrahman Diallo from Guinea. Um, actually, I'd like to have a warm applause for him because he has been going around this conference <laughs> talking a lot, talking a lot about uh, the different experiences in Guinea, which you know, many of you, of course, know. Um, a country that has been struck some years back by the Ebola crisis. Um, he told me just before this panel that people who have not been in the region at the time could not have imagined the kind of economic uh, devastation that that epidemic brought about. Um, but like he also said, every crisis is also an opportunity. 
Um, so he will be talking about how Guinea is currently trying to deal with the human resources for health uh, mo resource mobilization. And then last but not least, I would like to invite Dr. Aridro, um, state, he's actually deputy finance minister. It's a long title, but he told me, call me deputy finance minister. Dr. Aridro, warm applause for you as well from Uganda. He's a civil engineer by training way back when. And then he said, I always get this the first question, how does a civil engineer end up in finance? For me, that is not such a question because I know civil engineers have straight ways of thinking. They're, most of the time, they're straight thinkers. Um, but anyway, he will tell you a little bit about how in Uganda currently, um, the government is dealing with the human resources for health uh, mobilization. And he will um, also, I think, talk from a wide experience because he's been in this arena for quite a while. So we have four very, very experienced panelists. And I'm basically going to ask him a first opening question. And that will be very simple, simple in inverted commas. We've been here now, most of us have been here four days. Everybody has been stressing how important human resources for health are and how there are many, many interesting shifts occurring at the moment and how investing in human resources for health is so hugely important. So how, from your perspective, also as ADG now at WHO, do you feel um, we can mobilize the necessary resources? Okay. But, uh, thank you very much for introducing me and good morning, everybody. Uh, I just joined the WHO just one month ago, and my original position has come from, I come from Japan, and uh, I think that Japan is the second honest country in the world, uh, next to the Dublin. If you lose your, or drop your purse or wallet in my countries, you will uh, return, you know, receive your wallet within the money. Uh, so you could enjoy my country as well. So, as the moderator has already said, and also many, everybody agreed on that, sir. Uh, UHC is, we believe that you convince ourselves that UHC is uh, not only the foundation of the uh, happiness or health of the individuals, but also the foundation for the prosperity or stability of the society. The, our challenge is how to uh, resource how to mobilize the resources for the health, human, health workers or health human resources. And my point is human resource development takes a time. And we, it requires a continuous and sustainable investment. So it means that we need a long-term long -term commitment from the political level as a, and the community, community level and the regional level as well. So, and also we need to create an appropriate environment for the health workers who could uh, pay the appropriately, and uh, they provided the uh, tools to, uh, for services. In that case, it, uh, it's uh, just we need to strengthen the health system, and uh, uh, that's why the UHC is a core uh, for uh, the health and as well as uh, for the. Uh, investment with health workers. And uh, to mobilize the resources, uh, I think the, we, I should say two dimensions. One is a community environment empowerment. And the second, uh, the other dimension is a high level political commitment or momentum. We need to work together in both of them and uh, uh, encourage the global community to work for it. Thank you. Thank you very much for this, this first statement. I know the WHO has been very much involved with this agenda. A lot of people here have, have heard a lot about how um, also these forums, that now the fourth, how the forums have actually contributed to you know, the instrumentation, to creative ideas about putting, not only putting the spotlight on human resources for health, mm -hmm. but also finding creative ways to move forward. Mm -hmm. now, from your own experience, uh, you can also draw on what you saw from your former job in Japan. Yes. Um, you've been in the field for quite a long time. Do you feel there is a positive change occurring at the moment in the attention for human resources for health? 
Yes, I think so, and I would like to believe so, because uh, uh, at the global level, we have a wonderful meeting. That, that forum is started from the 2009, right? The first forum started, and the second and third forums they keep the legacy for it. And the, the, this time, uh, this all experience and the knowledge has already accumulated and get together. So. Uh, we have a good, uh, good success, I mean, good, we have a success and wonderful experience as well. But also at the same time, still we have a uh, failure or under uh, investment of the human resources and uh, uh, finances resources. So, but uh, we could run and each other. And so I think that it's getting better. I'm, I'm going to your neighbor who has also been around quite a long time, 30 years. He's smiling like one of these people who has seen it all. <laughs> uh, Dr. Leyland, you, you've, you've been working in different parts of the world. You've been working in, in challenged environments. You've been working in, in um, more sort of relaxed environments. Uh, you've been working on research. You've been working on um, the implementation of new strategies to fight malaria. Um, so from your long perspective, where do you feel currently the opportunities lie to mobilize resources for human resources for health. Yes, thanks. Um, first of all, I haven't seen it all. Uh, in fact, just uh, the opportunity to be here. This is the first time I've been in one of these um, forums. Uh, I know this is the fourth. Hopefully it's not the last because even the brief time I've been here, I'm learning a lot just from interaction um, with many folks here in the room. Um, I'm happy to be here also on behalf of the Administrator of USAID and obviously in my present position as uh, the Deputy Coordinator of the President's Malaria Initiative. Going back, just to emphasize the point that my colleague from WHO mentioned, the importance of sort of a sustained long-term involvement in these areas. USAID has had a, has like a 30-year history of <coughs> workforce development, support for that. And it's sort of evolved over time with a clear focus on HRH. Um, and part of that's driven by the recognition, as you all know, that um, poor health is an impediment to development, and better health is actually one of the drivers to, uh, for countries to develop further. Presently, we support that with our funds through sort of two primary mechanisms. One is the, the sort of central mechanism, which many of you may become familiar with at this conference, the, HRH 2030 project, which is a $141 million five-year project um, to work with countries on HRH issues. Uh, presently, USAID has HRH programs in about 25 countries. And then secondly, there's these pretty significant bilateral programs that are disease-specific. The President's uh, Emergency Program for AIDS Response, PEPFAR, and the program I work for, which is the President's Malaria Initiative, because, you know, the, the fact that HRH issues are a major cost driver for health at country level, up to 33% of, of the budgets go into HRH, that's also true for these bilateral programs. So within PEPFAR and PMI, somewhere around 40% of our resources actually go into HRH issues. Um, and that includes everything from supporting um, doctors, nurses, social workers, community health workers, to the broader systems issues to be able to help these people do their jobs. However, going forward, um, I mean, the recognition that there's a, going to be a need for 18 million new health workers to meet these 2030 goals, that obviously can't be met just with external funding. So we're working closely with countries and many of you um, to see how we can um, do better resource mobilization at the country level because there's clearly efficiencies. I mean, countries already are putting fairly significant parts of their own budgets into HRH issues, but there's clear that there's some pretty significant efficiencies that can be made through a number of different things, uh, and we have some experience with this one I'm happy to talk about maybe later in the, the session. And then secondly, that gap in healthcare workers is not going to be met just by the public sector. I mean, there's clear need to for greater private sector engagement in these issues at the country level, and I think there's some real opportunity to do that and some real experience to do so. Um, and some of the, uh, um, I mean, many countries, as you know, up, up to half the healthcare services are already being provided by the private sector. 
Um, and in some countries, that's working quite well. It obviously can work better. And I think that there's some real opportunities to work with that sort of public-private partnership around these issues to see how that can be done in a way which actually results in a better health workforce and actually um, plugging the sorts of gaps which we're all familiar with, where you have a misallocation of, I mean, some areas have no health workers, others have more health workers. Um, and then other resource mobilization efforts at the country level, I think, needs to be tied to this broader issue of the overall better financial management systems at the country level. Um, we've seen clearly that with working with countries to actually look at the financial management systems, and specifically when it comes to the, the human resources for health aspect of that budget, there's some real efficiencies that can be gained. For example, USAID, I mean, just as an example, um, looking at um, working with the Dominican Republic as a recent example, um, looking at that health resources for health budget, there was an additional $22 million which was freed up just because of efficiencies in the budget itself, which allowed for an additional 5,700 health workers to be hired. So I'll just stop there. I mean, I think it's, again, we're in here for the long term with our resources to work with um, those of you here in this room and, and more importantly, the countries themselves for the additional resources that will continue to be needed over a period of time to help countries. But secondly, in order to push towards these new goals, it's a combination of greater national resource mobilization, greater use of efficient use of the existing resources, and greater involvement of the private sector in these issues. Okay, well, we'll come back to all three topics. But there's one thing I can't help myself from asking. Yesterday we had a fantastic conversation here in the hall about um, collective responsibilities. Mm -hmm. And so, for instance, when you talk about inefficiencies, um, in the 30 years that you've been in the field of international health development, um, there's a saying in my country that says, change the world, but start with yourself. Um, how do you feel, or where do you feel that in that long experience that you're now looking back, you say, well, we have also been extremely inefficient in certain places? Well, yeah, again, we are all in this um, learning and working together. So the evolution of um, USAID, of PMI, uh, the, pre the President's Malaria Initiative, I'll just talk spe specifically about something I know quite well. The President's Malaria Initiative has been around since 2005. And I know we're in Guinea and Uganda, here with our colleagues here on this, uh, this side of the table as well. And, you know, initially um, there wasn't a lot of experience with, I mean, there was a recognition that malaria was a, a driver of poverty and it affected the poorest communities in countries like Guinea and Uganda. And frankly, were beyond the reach of the formal health system in many of these areas. Um, I don't, that's not a, a surprise to those of you who've worked in some of these challenging environments. However, in order to have success for malaria and driving down the disease burden, we needed to work with governments and partners at the country level to figure out how do you actually get out to these remote areas particularly for a disease as devastating as malaria, where people can literally die within hours or a couple of days. So you don't have a lot of time to, to, to not sort that out. Um, so we didn't know exactly how that was going to work. Um, and, but over time, I think uh, most of our involvement and support of countries has resulted in some pretty remarkable results. We're kind of fortunate in malaria because of the nature of the disease that you know, when we first started, all we had was microscopy, and as our colleagues, my colleagues here from Uganda and Guinea know, that was fairly limiting. Um, so we were putting a lot of resources into how do you maintain microscopy, how do you train people to do microscopy, how do you, in areas where there's no electricity frequently, there's no, that changed dramatically. Again, we get to the response from the private sector with the development of rapid diagnostic test. Mm -hmm. um, so now, at a very local level in Uganda, in Guinea, and others, people in the villages themselves have been empowered to be part of the health system where you can stick a finger within 10 minutes, have the result on the spot, and you have the three-day treatment of highly effective drugs there at the village level. Um, and that's all plugged into the local health system with the clinics and stuff. 
that's somewhat new. That was a learning process, and, I, and as we've had more and more experience with that, more and more countries are taking that on, and we're seeing some real success. Thank you. I'm turning to our colleague from Uganda. Um, you've been also around quite a lot in the, in the administration of your country. Um, yes. How are in your departments, because the finance department, we, it was said many times over the last few days, is crucial for the health uh, agenda. So how in your department do you talk about human resources for health and resource mobilization for that topic? Is it an issue? Uh, thank you. Uh, <clears throat> yes, it's an issue. As you all know, uh, resources are always finite. Uh, for government of Uganda specifically, in terms of our budgeting, especially for the health center, uh, health care uh, sector. Uh, health care is number four in terms of our overall budgeting uh, for, for the country. So we take it very, very serious and very important because, you see, a healthy nation is a very progressive nation. So that has been the principle behind our, our, our budgeting. Um, you know, over the years, of course, if you go back to about 19, early 1990s, the what we we'll call the, uh, when we came out of that very difficult situation, and our people, people's health was really at risk. It tended to affect the economic growth, because once you have a healthy nation, then that translates into economic growth. People become very productive, and they're able to participate in, the, in economic activities. So we took a decision as government to, to sort of put a healthcare uh, sector as a very important sector, apart from energy and, and, and infrastructure. So what we have tended to do in Uganda over the years is the traditional way of bu uh, budgeting for the health, uh, the health sector, where government builds the, 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 the infrastructure, government trains the doctors through the universities that we have, and they are deployed then into the health centers and the, and the hospitals and so on. But we came to realize that it is not something which is probably not sustainable. Because investments in the health sector are very, very expensive. Especially if you have to build a specialized hospital. The equipment are very expensive. And even the infrastructure itself is very expensive. So two years ago, uh, I sponsored a bill in parliament. That is a private-public partnership bill as uh, the Minister of Investment at that particular time. And the bill went through the parliament and it has now become law. What it has now done is it has opened now the avenues for private sectors to come and participate in the health center, uh, sector. We have licensed so far, I think, about three uh, investors. What the government did was to give them land, to say, here's the land please put up the, the specialized hospital which you, which, you, which you are proposing to build. So that way then, part of the burden now has been shifted over to the private sector, for which of course they will charge accordingly. Uh, just as an example, I think annually Uganda spends close to about $250 million to send patients outside the country, in the UK, South Africa, India, USA. So we said, no, that cannot be sustainable. Let's try to uh, do most of these specialized treatment within the country. That was the basis on which we, we gave licenses to private operators to put up hospitals, specialized hospitals, uh, where then Ugandans can be treated uh, uh, within the country, and hence save that uh, foreign exchange currency that uh, we're sending outside the country. What we're also looking at is that as government, we could put up the infrastructure, whatever hospital it is, and we'll give it to, to be run by doctors. Another model of PPP, because as you know, in most countries, uh, management of hospitals is also a problem as far as government is concerned. But if you put up the infrastructure as government and hand it over to, to private doctors to run it on behalf of government, that also improves the efficiency in the whole healthcare system. So that is something that we have uh, uh, been looking at. But we've also been working with the development partners such as USD, and US, uh, USAID, and the UK Overseas Development and so on to assist us, particularly in the provision of medicines, 
that is the other source of financing that uh, uh, support that we get from uh, from development partners such as UK, USD, uh, and so on. So we, we it is a mix, basically a mix of uh, financial options, which we think one can deliver quality healthcare to the people, and two that it is also affordable to the people, because in the healthcare, uh, as you know, healthcare. Uh, provision of services, it's, it's quite an expensive uh, venture. So we're looking at all options to try to see what will be the most appropriate, affordable, and efficient uh, delivery of uh, health services to uh, the people of Uganda. Now, now, recently, I follow news in your country a little bit, so there were a lot of strikes. Um, there have been different kinds of challenges to the system, and it's not only because people say the volume of health workers, but also the quality of work. Yes. The payment, now payment is always an issue, but um, so we have been talking a lot here about it's not only having more health workers, it's also having more health workers in decent work, Absolutely. in decent conditions. Yes. I see that the mix that you're using um, makes sense. Yes. You, you do public-private partnerships, you, uh, at the same time, the doctors and nurses are still on strike. So how do you talk about that in the Ministry of Finance? You see, uh, largely the healthcare, uh, the, the provision of healthcare, I think we've taken it as a responsibility of government to the people. Uh, to the extent that most of the hospitals and clinics services are largely free to uh, what we call the, uh, those who cannot afford uh, private uh, healthcare services. So the, the, the policy has been designed in such a way that at your level, you can be able to access the healthcare services. And the, recently, what we have, uh, the last one, which we have uh, policy that we're looking at now is the, the healthcare system, a uh, healthcare insurance system, which has not been there in the country for, as far as government is concerned. In the private sector, it is there, but not in government, mm -hmm. because largely it has been free government took that responsibility to provide health care for those who cannot afford it. But those who are able to afford it, they will take the health care insurance policy, which then will help them to access services either in the private hospitals or outside the country. So that is something that we're trying to now introduce also in, in the, in, in, in the, in, in the, in the health care uh, provision of health care services, so that it is mandatory for everybody. As you know, for example, the Canadian model is one of the best uh, healthcare uh, systems in the world where everybody is covered. As long as you are a resident of, of, of Canada, you are mandated to have uh, uh, healthcare insurance, which then helps you to access services. So that is something that we are actually now looking at to be able to, to cover really everybody instead of government taking that responsibility. So that, that links to what our colleague from WHO was saying, implicate populations now in a way, try to think about domestic health financing. Absolutely, absolutely. Uh, yeah. We're going to talk about this in more depth, but I first want to hear Dr. Diallo. You've been going the rounds here in the conference, different sessions where you have been talking a lot about um, mobilizing resources for human resources for health in rural areas, because a lot of the innovation tends to stick in capitals, um, the urban zones, et cetera, where we heard several people in the hall commenting on the fact that so many um, slightly more remote places, geographically challenged places, um, the services remain fairly low. And the human resources, um, there's lack of staff. Mm. So can you say maybe for the people who have not heard about what Guinea has been doing there, and then also comment on the general question, where do you feel you should be moving? <clears throat> Thank you. Thank you for having me, and good morning, everyone. Um, it, it Thank you for having me. Um, I, I cannot talk about this and not link it to Ebola. I, I, I guess everyone has heard me uh, uh, link these issues to what happened to, to Guinea. Frankly, the, the Ebola outbreak in West Africa was a real eye-opener. Um, I think the whole world saw how a, a health problem can bring um, an entire country down. Matter of fact, a whole sub-region, uh, the whole world was affected by, by really what happened um, uh, in West Africa with, with Ebola. I guess it was a, 
a real case for 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 really investing in in, in health and human resources in in, in particular. For us, um, we we very quickly drew lessons. We knew why it was bad. We knew. Um, that uh, the epidemic was bad because simply our system was not resilient, our system was not ready, and in all its components, it was frankly not ready. The infrastructure was not there. The lab capacity was not there. Like I mentioned to a couple of people before, the first samples that were taken in Guinea had to be shipped out of the country for the diagnosis. And in terms of human resources, it was a real catastrophe. The number was not there, the quality was not there, and um, a quick analysis showed us that we had a deficit of about 10,000 uh, healthcare workers in Guinea when, when, when that happened. And um, if you, you, you further dig down, 80% um, of the healthcare uh, professionals that we had in Guinea were going to retire in the next five years without any strategy for actually replacing them. And you, you further dig down again, <coughs> You realize that half of those uh, that were there, were, half of those that were not going to retire also were about 40, uh, 45 years old. So we really needed to rethink our strategy and very quickly address that issue. We, we hired 4,000 health care professionals and deployed uh, about 99% of those out to the field but again faced a major challenge. How do you maintain those out there? How do you make sure that they don't come back to the capital city? Because 80%, um, like I said, uh, of our doctors are currently concentrated in the capital, leaving rural areas where you have really 80% of the problems completely empty. So we really, really um, had to rethink our strategy. That's why we decided to focus more on, uh, on the rural area, on the community. Um, out of our priorities, developing and putting in place a community health system is really, really at the top. And the system that we thought of is known as a rural pipeline. It has four components. The first one being uh, developing an integrated package of health services. We came up with, uh, with about 17 different interventions that include really what, what, what uh, one would expect in terms of primary health care, going from family planning to full fledged immunization services, including infection prevention, nutrition, hygiene, I mean, um, the, the, the whole package. So coming up with uh, an integrated package of services. And the second point being defining <coughs> the profile of community health workers that would be able to deliver that package of service. And um, the third piece being uh, developing upstream and downstream linkages because the idea for us, uh, the reason why we call it rural pipeline, the idea is to locally recruit people, train them, and then use them locally so that you won't have to deal with that issue of people actually running back to the, to the capital. It turns out that we had an opportunity. We had these uh, regional um, schools that actually train what we call health technicians, because in our, our category, categories of health care professionals, we have doctors, we have nurses, <coughs> midwives, and then the health technicians. Those are trained for three years. And um, they actually have a degree, they have a diploma at the end. They, they, they're very close to, to nurses, basically. So the idea is to have those leave a health facility, go to the community, mm -hmm. deliver a package of service um, uh, there. And then the last component of that, um, that whole uh, uh, intervention is to medicalize health centers, because up until now we've had health technicians run, run those health centers, and we decided <coughs> to put in general practitioners uh, at that level. The reason why it is important to focus uh, really at the community level, to focus in that very first line is the following. I always say this, um, the first people with the Ebola symptoms that went to health facilities, uh, the guards were down. I mean, the guards were down, the healthcare professionals were not prepared. I always say this, from the community, people would always go to a health facility with symptoms. They would never come 
and say, I would like to see an Ebola doctor. I would like to see the malaria doctor. I would like to see the tuberculosis doctor. I would like to see the HIV. They will come with symptoms. They will come with headaches. They will come uh, with a hemorrhage. They will come with whatever symptoms they have. So the quality of that initial care mm -hmm. makes the whole difference. So that is why it is very important to strengthen primary health care at that very first line. Mm -hmm. There's no disease surveillance if you don't strengthen the community-based community so surveillance. This sounds very logical. Yeah. At the same time, did it work? Oh, yes, it is. Actually, uh, during Ebola, um, the, the category of people that made a difference, again, was uh, those community-based uh, uh, folks. They were volunteers, and there was obviously a limitation there because they, was not pay they were not paid. And the idea is actually to formally hire, hire those and train them. It is working currently. The only problem is it's fragmented because the family planning program has its own community <coughs> health workers. The HIV AIDS program has its own community health workers. Uh, disease uh, prevention and control has its own um, uh, health prevention work. So the idea is to actually integrate those services and um, have properly trained people deliver them. Thanks very much. Can I turn to Dr. Nalin here? Because this, this is what you all, always hear. People also criticize a little bit that, that good external programs might come in, uh, mm -hmm. but they fragment the system. So. When you hear this at the, at the rural level, great attempts are made to create more integrated health worker mm -hmm. system, but at the same time, every program has its own community health workers. You feel as somebody who is in the arena of setting some of these services up, that improvements are still possible there? Sure. Um, and again, First of all, and again, I'll speak from a PMI perspective, because we try not to replicate mistakes that have happened historically where people come in from outside and will go to the Ministry of Health and say, here's some money, you do this. Um, our approach has always been, again, going back to the Paris meeting and the OECD, the OECDAC, uh, to actually work with the National Ministry of Health and the national program. So if you actually look at our annual malaria operational plans and how we do our financing, it's very much looking at gaps in the national plan and working with the National Malaria Control Program and others to fill those gaps. Um, and in some countries, malaria was sort of a pathfinder for some of these community-based platforms, because many countries, when we first got started, even though there was an intention to move beyond just the bricks and mortars of hospitals and clinics, but to develop community-based platforms, there was really no way forward on how to do that. And like I said, I think uh, in countries like Guinea and, and Uganda and many high burden countries in Africa, malaria is a perfect fit for that because it's such a huge burden on communities. And the tools we have can actually be easily delivered at the community level. That's not true of some diseases that require much more, much longer treatment, much more laboratory support, et cetera, et cetera. So when we uh, you know, got started in working with our colleagues in Guinea and Uganda and the other um, 20, now 24 countries in Africa where we're working, we ba definitely took, um, took the lead from the ministry itself. Like, what do you want to do? And how can malaria help start rolling out some of this? When we train, for example, for um, case management for malaria in communities, it's not actually case management for malaria. It's case management for febrile illness. So we may be providing the commodities for the rapid diagnostic test and the drugs for, that actually is, the, is it's training around the whole approach to febrile case management. Similarly, the malaria and pregnancy piece, because as you're all aware, in the African setting, women of reproductive health are the main adult target group because of the, the big impact of malaria during pregnancy on the mother and, and, and newborn. We don't train just around malaria. We train around the whole focused antenatal care package so taking this disease-specific funding where there's a major impetus to address a disease with a huge burden on the health of the population and, frankly, also on the, on the health system itself. You know, in, in Guinea or Uganda where, you know, 30 to 40 percent of the outpatient visits are for malaria and up to half the hospital hospitalizations are due to malaria, doing something about malaria 
potentially, and we're already seeing it, can, can help unburden the health system to allow it to deal better with other diseases. Um, I think when I listen to Dr. Diallo, I think that, that in itself is not the problem. The fact that people come in and assist with certain major diseases, I think that's absolutely fantastic. But what you're saying is it comes with a lot of inefficiencies. There's, uh, so instead of getting an integrated health workforce and mobilizing people around a sort of an integrated plan, everybody comes in with their own plan and with their own assessment right. systems. And, and right, and this is where I'm going to push back yeah. on that because okay. what I said was we do not come in with our own plan. Okay. We're coming in to support the National Malaria Control Plan, Absolutely. and it's actually the ministry that asks for resources to go out and get this started. And it's all, this is about excellence being the enemy of the good. You can always say, well, we're going to go out now and in every community have a community health worker, but most, most um, ministries and governments haven't been able to really figure out how to do that. So I've always said that malaria is sort of a canary in the coal mine for a health system in Africa. If it's working well, you can see less diseases and deaths due to malaria. If it's not working well, you see a huge burden. So all the different aspects of the health system, um, if you're doing, if you have some resources for malaria to drive that forward, you can actually start seeing improvements. And again, we did not come in, PMI did not come in to Guinea or to Uganda and say, we want to go out and create our own cadre of community health workers. It is true that in many countries, again, if you, if you roll this back like, 10 or 15 years where there was a, you know, there were new things going on. The, the HIV epidemic um, in many of these countries was indeed an emergency. And some of the things that was started early on to get things started, I don't think was ever the, in, that was an emergency response. It was never the intention that that's the way things would continue. And now there's an opportunity as countries and, and programs have become more mature to sit back and figure out how this can all be um, incorporated together. I mean, everyone uses Ethiopia as an example of rolling out, extending the health system to communities, and a lot of that was done with disease-specific funding from PMI and PEPFAR and the Global Fund and the government itself. So we're all, and again, we look for the leadership of the ministers of health in, in Uganda and Guinea and all the countries we work to help us work with them to figure this out. But I think there is a danger here of, you know, this sort of false dichotomy between disease-specific funding and the general health system, because I think you can actually, with, with good national leadership and the willingness of partners at the country level to work with that, go quite far with the resources that are presently available. Um, Dr. Yamamoto, I, we talk a lot about, mm. also over the last few days, we've been talking a lot about shifting the spectrum of health workers, having more flexibility, more diversity, uh, linking to other sectors of the economy, um, and then mobilizing resources that way because you broaden the spectrum. Now, this is, this is nice to say, but if you think about countries that are already challenged economically, like for instance, Guinea after Ebola, mm -hmm. uh, is it not pushing too much burden on these countries to say, well, now you have to do this, this, and this, while they're recovering from a shock. Mm -hmm. So how, how do you see the demands that are now increasingly put on countries, and maybe rightly so, mm -hmm. to say, create domestic mm -hmm. resource bases uh, for your health sector and, and your human resources for health? Yes, uh, uh, but uh, first of all, I should say that some, uh, I just joined, the, as I said, that's joined WHO, so sometimes I, my cap is uh, still Japanese countries or WHO countries, and there also, I, I, my brain is so, uh, swelling, but uh, there also, that, uh, as I say, that uh, I had experience to work with the USAID, but also uh, the Uganda minister, and there was the Guinea minister, so we have a G20 meeting and discuss about it, and there also uh, African developing meetings, so we have a couple of times to discuss about it, and uh, every time I learn a lot from the, these countries. As, uh, as, uh, I'm not uh, sure this is a direct answer to uh, your uh, questions, but uh, first of all, I should say that uh, uh, we need to think about, every time we need to think about the resource allocations. Even in my countries, there's some uh, pressure uh, from the heavyweight person, 
I think we are very important person or politicians push us to put the money, more money for the tertiary care or urban hospital and so on, rather than put the money for primary health care or rural area care, rural area cares. So we need a very strong commitment for the uh, political leaders, but as well as the global community and as well as the community, uh, community uh, uh, workers. And uh, regarding the efficiency and efficacy or effectiveness, uh, I understand that, uh, that each, don each country has their own ownership based on their own national programs. We all in the global community need to work together or support for the countries. But sometimes I still feel that some uh, donors or agencies are too pushy to bring their own agenda to ask the, each countries to you know, implement their agendas. So I still feel we need uh, some, we have a spaces to improve it. And uh, as a WHO, I understand my colleague, now WHO, my colleagues works very hard and uh, to work together with the uh, country uh, level, at the country level, and also uh, try to uh, integrate the health services. But still, we have a lot of spaces. So uh, my, our new leader, Tedros, is uh, going to put the priority on the country level support, rather than the, uh, in, in addition to the normative and the, uh, guidelines, uh, normative function as the WHO. So we, we so WHO has been, of course, focused because it's a member state organization. Has been focusing on country level support. That is its constitutional mandate. Mm -hmm. um, now, in this domain, where do you feel the big possibilities for improvement are? So, in the domain of mobilizing resources for mm -hmm. the human resources in health, where do you feel the big possibilities lie in the coming decade? Yes. Uh, I know everybody is already aware that 80% uh, uh, or 78, more than 80% of our health resources come from the dom domestic area rather than the international resources. <coughs> so, but uh, for myself, is uh, still we have a uh, uh, big, not big, but the opportunity to increase the international resources. For example, like a w, uh, World Bank is going to put the priority to them uh, using funds for health area. Uh, rather than other in infrastructure area. So, I mean, uh, we can e use the existing fund. Also, uh, there are a lot of opportunity to invite the private sector or philanthropies as well as the donor countries, as, as also countries as own well. And also, I just want to point out one other issue is uh, for the community-based health workers, uh, they have already had a lot of ideas, and also uh, they face a lot of challenges. So how we would like to encourage and empower the health workers who work at the community level to translate their uh, idea to the national policy or national plan, and a global community could you know, support them. I mean, start up upstreaming way or field basis to the policy level. That circle should be more important, I think. And WHO would like to work for it. I, I, I like this appeal to also sort of new forms of global collaboration rather than maybe the old, the old ways in which the so-called development aid uh, took place. Um, so if, if I look at both of you, having been around in your ministries for quite a while, uh, Dr. Adir, uh, if, if you think about where would, f from your perspective, you said public-private partnerships, leveraging the private sector in different ways, um, taking a bit more control again of all the streams that are going out, uh, bringing it back in. Those are logically sounding, but will they be enough to tackle the crisis of human resources in health, to tackle the quality of care that you know, health workers are complaining about, uh, their quality of their work? So. Are the efforts that you sketched earlier, will they do the job? Or do you, do you also think about other ways of still moving further? <clears throat> no, I think as a, as a country, uh, we're always uh, open to new ideas. But one big intervention that I think I, I, I missed out is in the provision of, uh, of drugs. 
uh, especially for malaria, for HIV AIDS, the ARVs, and other tropical diseases. What the government also did was to say, produce, we shall buy, that policy. Uh, so what, is, what has happened is there are private companies that have invested in provision of those drugs which has tended to drain a lot of uh, resources from government. It's provision of ARVs, malaria, and also for some of the cancer treatment, uh, 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 for cancer treatment. So these companies then will produce the drugs and we guarantee to them that we shall pay and we shall buy. So it has encouraged them to actually do that investment, the private partnership which I was talking about. Uh, so that has encouraged private companies now to come up uh, and, and produce the drugs locally as opposed to having to import them. That was also has uh, sort of lessened the, the budget. But on the provision of uh, uh, quality healthcare staff, uh, as I said, it has been traditional really the role of, of uh, of, of, of government to do that through the various institutions, whether at nursing level, whether at uh, midwife level, even doctor's level, and so on. Now, we go to that extent of sponsoring some of doctors for specialized training in areas that really need specialized training. So that role, as you know, training a doctor is very expensive, and it has tended to actually uh, uh, be largely dependent on, real, on government to do that. Um, the other thing which... Would, would you feel yes. that with the, the measures that you take, that uh, I heard already 80% is domestically funded? Yes. Yes. Could you go to 100%? Could you go at this stage in Uganda to 100% domestically funded resource mobilization for resources and health so that people feel they're in decent jobs? Could you do that as a country already? No, certainly, we, yes, yes, we can. And we have done it in a number of instances, not, not en masse, but we have done it in a number of instances. And also, we, as I said, we've been working with our development partners where they will offer a scholarship to our, our doctors to come and train outside on condition that once they finish, they go back and work in the country. Um, we have done that. So we're looking at all possible ways in terms of which to, to build capacity, especially in the, in, the health center, uh, in the health sector, particularly at the specialized level, not the primary provision of primary health care. That has basically been taken care of. But we're looking at now the sort of advanced and specialized uh, training of, of, of doctors and nurses and so on. So those, uh, we work with our development partners to be able to do that here. That's where your investment would go for the next phase. Absolutely. Dr. Diala, same, same question for you with, with what you sketched. Huh? You said the, the, the crisis, the Ebola crisis, was also an opportunity. Have you taken full um, profit from the opportunity? And are you capable of moving this thing further? Where would the opportunities lie now to actually become 100% domestically funded? Through, through the, like I said, the, the, it was bad um, and sad, but frankly, uh, it was also an opportunity. Uh, I would like to, to uh, follow up on, on that, that question that you talked about. So the, the development partners come in and uh, uh, say, for instance, we're talking about PMI here or PEPFAR for that matter, although Guinea is not a PEPFAR country, but they come in uh, and, and provide commodities through um, uh, a pool procurement mechanism, an international pool procurement mechanism. They also provide the technical assistance. But frankly, when it comes to um, human resources development, I think the countries, the host countries need also to, to step in and at least cover the human resources side. And I have to be very careful here, transition from being an international consultant into to, uh, taking on a government role. But human resources development is frankly the responsibility of a host country um, government. And I, I believe okay, so it is doable. Okay, so you state your responsibility, but we're also very much interested here, also in this panel, in the how. So how um, would you then translate that? No, it, it, it is doable. For, for uh, I'll give you an example. Guinea, uh, in um, 2015, uh, you may not believe this, but the, the budget allocated to the health sector was a little bit above 2%. So um, in 2016, that got doubled. It uh, got to 4 and something percent. In 2017, Guinea is at 834 
I understand that it's still below the Abuja declaration expectation, but there is a trend here going from 2% to 4% to 8% and means that it's doable. And I mentioned earlier... But the is that money going to human resources and health? Or is it going to tertiary hospitals or... No, it goes, it goes to the health sector, but it's, 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 it includes human resources. I just mentioned 4,000 uh, um, health professionals that we hired earlier this year in March. And it came out of that budget, 4,000 that we deployed at once. For a country like Guinea, it's, it's, it's frankly something not to, not to neglect. And it's a process that is going to continue. It means that really um, uh, it is doable, it's possible. And, and, and I, I say this again, I mean, when donors come in and help in, in different ways in infrastructure development, uh, capacity development and all that when it comes to human resources, at least the hiring process and paying salaries and the basic allowances and benefits, I believe that host country should step in and, and, and cover that. Okay, I'm gonna go to the hall now um, and the question, to all of you is, we're, we're talking here about creative ways in which to mobilize resources for this urgent agenda of tackling the gap that is still there between health workers' numbers and quality of work today and um, what need, is needed by 2030. So I want to see hands of people um, that feel that they have something to contribute to creativity at this hour. The big question being what we heard here, leveraging the private sector, getting um, more control over what is what, having domestic production uh, more stimulated, um, tackling inefficiencies, those kinds of things have been mentioned by the panel. Are there more creative or other creative solutions to tackling the gap? I'm looking at, I see somebody here that would love to say something, I can see. <laughs> Thank you. I, I can read his face now. <laughs> so, um, shall I take it? Yeah. Um, th thank you very much, uh, Rudiger Krech, uh, Director for Health Systems at WHO. Um, and first of all, I think we should look at what already has been achieved. Um, we had in the very first panel, you may, may recall, um, the issue of um, accountability and, and follow-up with action. So the move for action was very very clear also in the third global forum. And we had many countries who identified their commitments. And you may have seen that there's a, an analysis that followed from this uh, that was published in the BMJ lately that showed that 25 countries, you here, 25 countries in full implemented the commitments they made last time. 21 countries are on a good pathway. So I would like to just um, balance out a bit that, that notion that um, uh, we're not following through. I think this forum again has shown that we are moving into the right direction in action, that we are also looking at how we can better understand the intersectoral nature of the action, so there's much more we need to learn, but it's not like there's no action at all, and I wanted to just rebalance that. Well, I don't, I don't think anybody said there's no action, I think, but it's a little bit like with climate change, there is action, but is it, is it enough to meet the targets? You can always do more. Now, that is it's a good, good sign. I'm looking at you, yes. Hi, I'm Kate Talenko with Corvus Health, and we've talked a lot about how we can be creative with donor funding and with government funding, but we haven't spoken about out-of-pocket funding, which in many countries actually can be the single largest uh, expenditure on health, and how we influence consumers' behavior of where they put their money regarding the quality health workforce. And there are some mechanisms, for example, safe care can give a grade to any type of health facility to let consumers know, you know, this is a sort of a score one facility, a, a worst facility where this is a score five facility and help guide the consumer to better health workers um, because I think that's a, a, um, an opportunity. Thanks. I think it's a great point that you also have at the side of, of patients or clients or consumers of healthcare, you have more of an insight in what is what. At the same time, some healthcare, healthcare workers would like to do better, but there are circumstances where this is hard. Um, so I think there is a bit of a challenge here. I saw another hand here. Yes. Hi, I'm Björk Perlsetter from the Training for Health Equity Network. 
First of all, I just wanted to, to make some comments. Having been somebody who's just moved from a public health system in Europe to a f more for-profit system in the U.S., so I think I'm very much supportive of uh, private-public partnership for, prof for, for public service or public good, but I think it's, we have to be careful about thinking that private sector necessarily always build builds efficiency. However, I do think that it's really important to think widely. We've seen with our schools that a lot of things and resources can be mobilized at local community levels using small businesses, community <coughs> pooling, there's, there's lots of ways and I think a lot of the change, if we can foster that, that it's not all coming from, from general sort of central levels, but you need government support of those initiatives at local levels. So I think you're, you're enhance what was said here earlier, that there is much more we can do from the, the clients, the patients themselves. I have to share a little story with you. I, I did some research in Malawi at some point about how this has nothing to do with health, but same thing, how parents are willing to contribute to the, the schooling of their kids. Because the schooling is for free now, there's a lot of challenges that come with free education. And so if you saw what parents were willing to invest, and parents in, in challenged environments, but they were basically, so that money was there. Now, if that kind of money can be used better, I think that's quite a resource. So that was echoed here three times. Yes. Uh, Bob Guy with IntraHealth International. So my comments is um, twofold. One of, first one, it is clear that the agenda for financing <coughs> is still globally driven, and I think it's okay, but in order to translate this into real action in the field, I think we need a new governance model that is not necessarily rely entirely on government, because I think it's a little bit unrealistic to put the burden. So are there examples, in your opinion, where we are beginning to see mobilization at the country level with different stakeholders participating in governance, especially when it comes to raising funds for community health workers. Because I think really that's where the priority need to lie. It's been said the last two days. So how do we finance that? And that is actually the most difficult one. Because when you start thinking about, um, about uh, the cost of financing that. And I just don't think it's realistic to, to say that government can do it alone or that government can do it alone at 100%. So again, my question, are there examples of country level governance to really address this issue from, 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 from the countries? You're all sitting in the same road. It's not a coincidence. <laughs> But I think it's a similar question. Can we think about different stakeholder arrangements and different governance models that actually um, start to mobilize the resources that are there in a more intelligent and maybe also more efficient manner? Uh, I see a lot of hands now, so I'm coming to one and two. Uh, but I go first by this, yeah? I'll walk around. Good morning. Good morning. Uh, there's an important uh, element of creatively addressing this, which in our view as the Public Services International is global tax justice. Uh, from the Panama Papers to the Paradise Papers, these are not some Netflix series. These are resources that I am urging that we could utilize, you know, for public services, including uh, for funding human resources for health. Uh, credible sources put amount of money in tax havens at some 30 trillion US dollars. Uh, we think that we should fight for this to be, for, for, for regulations to be placed to make this available for funding. It, it might be said, oh, it's difficult, and it's not surprising why it is difficult. You have, I mean, people who are powerful people being involved in this. But the fact of the matter was that when the world felt there was the need to cut ways and manners of funding for terrorists, it was done, it has been done. And 
civil society in particular, I know it might be a bit difficult for member states of the WH to say this, but it's an important element of what we have to do in putting people before profit. And relatedly, the issue of funding models and conditions for loans is also important. This issue of public-private partnership. Yes, we can't wish away private sector uh, involvement in delivery of health, even if it is an, uh, a public good. But public-private partnership, more often than not, boils down to the public sector subsidizing private benefits and interests. And regarding conditionalities to loans, Liberia, Sierra Leone, conditions from international finance institutions contributed significantly to the shortfall of human health workforce, human resources for health, at the time that you had the outbreak. And then you started throwing money too little too late. So we think that austerity measures and measures that put people over, pro we should not prioritize Mammon over Eve and Adam. We should place our humanity first because health is a fundamental human right and we should work towards realizing that and funding human resource for health is central to this. Now, somebody is dispassionate at quarter past ten in the morning. Believe when you see him in the evening. This is uh, anyway. Thank you very much for it because it broadens and it widens um, the discussion to the whole financial system. Uh, where do we put our money? Where do we put our tax? Um, yes. Uh, Remco from Institute of uh, Institute of Tropical Medicine in Antwerp. I'm hearing myself here in echo. So I'm moving a little bit here. Um, in relation to what Baba was saying, we see the SEG price tag for investing in health systems. We know that domestically a lot of things can be done to, to finance and to increase fiscal space. But seeing the demographic growth and seeing the needs, there is still absolutely a need also for international financing and shared responsibility. Seeing the unstable economies and a little bit of uncertainties going ahead, uh, there might be a need also to, to look for international financing and to do exactly what Baba was saying, to look into innovative taxation, finance mechanisms, financial transaction tax, carbon tax, um, because we are all in this together. And it's as the, what, what happened in, in West Africa, uh, we see that uh, the health workforce and health systems, it's an international public good. So to come to that compact and define roles and tasks and what that means for finance is something that we need to wield out. Thanks very much. Yes. <clears throat> uh, thank you so much. Um, I'm Arish Law with the Frontline Health Workers Coalition and InterHealth International, as well as with a fellow with the Global Health Corps. Um, you know, you talk about uh, the, the role that private sector can play in, um, in new models for financing, and especially when it comes to addressing the workforce shortage. I think a model that we don't bring enough attention to and that I'd like to highlight is the um, ability to second um, expertise from private sector organizations. Um, one, orga one example that I often cite is how the United Parcel Service, or UPS, um, it, when the chance came to, to support um, global health, um, one, of the, one model they used instead of funding was to um, provide a senior executive to Gavi, um, and that, supp that supply chain executive helped Gavi strengthen their health system and vaccine delivery networks. And I think when we look at private sector and simply looking at them for funding is a huge disservice to the expertise that they can bring, the really focused expertise that they can bring to supply chain networks, informatics, and other, um, and other important aspects of global health. And so I think we should really look at sharing expertise rather than just purely funding when it comes to involving the private sector. I hear a lot of sort of frontline innovative thinking, different ways of thinking about the private sector as well. I, there's one final question there and then I'll move to the front. And all of a sudden there's three final hands, if they can be quick. Voilà. Final three comments, short and sharp. Thank you. Um, my name is Caroline Whitten, and I'm with MUSO, a health organization in Mali, working with the Ministry of Health to design and implement a proactive model of community-based service delivery. So thank you to the panelists. Um, I think it's important that so much of the conversation centered around community health care. 
um, when we think about achieving SDGs or from a global burden of disease perspective, this is, this is really important. My comment is that I think we have a responsibility in this room to call out financing mechanisms that don't work and particularly financing mechanisms that disproportionately negatively affect the poorest communities and the most marginalized. And I'm talking about user fees. <laughs> so um, it's, there's ample evidence from multiple contexts around the world that user fee, when, when user fees are removed, healthcare utilization goes up, particularly amongst the poor. And when user fees are introduced, the reverse effect happens. You, Use, usage goes down. There's also evidence that um, user, user fees is not a cost recuperating mechanism. There's very little cost recuperated into the healthcare system that comes from uh, patients, particularly the poorest patients, financing their own healthcare. So I, I just think we have a responsibility to fight against the inertia that exists to reverse the neoliberal policies that came out of the structural adjustment uh, era particularly, you know, and then led to initiatives like the Bamako Initiative, which came out of Mali, which is where I work, um, in, in 1987. Thanks very much. Revisit financial mechanisms that might not work. Let me see, yes. Final two, you're the last one. Thank you so much. My name is uh, Emmanuel Ogwa. I work for Japaigo in Nigeria. Um, as we talk about how to mobilize finance for, uh, for health in our countries, uh, something just came to my uh, mind. Um, part of the place we spend money on healthcare is in capacity building and training of healthcare workers, right? So but, uh, I want to say that maybe there could be new ways of doing trainings, for instance, instead of having to take healthcare workers out of their places of work, spending lots of money in a hotel just to build a capacity, we can as well take those trainings into their places of work, I mean, train them on site, then lots of money can be saved through that. Secondly, it's also important to keep a database of healthcare workers that have undergone capacity building so that we don't overtrain them at the expense of those who have not been trained at all. So doing this, we might be able to save some money for some more pressing healthcare needs in our countries. Also, I want to emphasize on the need for interest to be built on primary care, especially because when we prevent diseases, we don't have to bother so much about who to treat those diseases and how much to invest in treating those uh, diseases. Thank you. Thank you. And the final, if you can lean over a little this way, yes. Yes. Uh, do you want to keep the mic? All oh, right. Okay. Um, good morning. Miguel Cabral, a young um, medical doctor from Portugal uh, studying public health. Uh, I th building on some of the topics that were already raised, I would like to focus on the topic of efficiency. And uh, I would think that it would be interesting to talk about the lowest level of financial decision. Because um, this brings again the topic of autonomy, which would have to, again, be very connected to the accountability that we already talked. Um, but I think that sometimes the lowest level of decision making in terms of finances is very far away from the local level that could perhaps be the best ones to say where would it be the best way to invest. Um, and, and on that topic also, and, and perhaps the, the, the PMI experience could be interesting to see if you recognize at any point like when the, the level of decision making is closer or further away from the local level, is it do you see any difference in the, in the ability to be more efficient in the investment? Uh, and on building also on the part of, uh, of the, the um, where is our money going in terms of transparency? Because we, we hear values there are, that we cannot even understand because they're so big that I think that it's hard for us to grasp what the, do this, all this money mean. Uh, but where is it going? And are we able to see where is it, where is it going in terms of transparency? And, and I think that if people are able to see where it's going, uh, they could at least say, okay, this is going here and it doesn't make sense, as we already thought. Thank you. So we've had a series of beautiful remarks. I'm very sorry, we are f because the panel is gonna finish. We have the Dublin Declaration, tra -la -la, after this. So this is scheduled. Um, but what we heard is, a lot of 
uh, emphasis on, on shifting also the balance of power, um, getting more um, at community level, deciding where the decision making um, is actually taking place and how far that is removed from these community levels, looking at where the money is going generally um, and how money that is um, wasted generally um, could be made to work better for the health system. So there are all kinds of shifts that have been um, mentioned in the hall. Anja Sukat, any final comments on this? Um, our director, WHO uh, Health Financing, so she knows a lot about these things. <laughs> Thanks, uh, Rod Deliver. Um, yes, I'm Anja Sukat, I'm the director for health financing at, uh, at the WHO. And I think I want to say that uh, listening to this conversation, what comes very clearly out, and particularly from the example of, of, uh, uh, of the countries here, is that investment in the health workforce will mostly have to come from domestic resources. And our uh, analytical work, the studies we've been doing as a background to the Commission on Health Employment and Economic Growth, shows very clearly that all countries can do better. Countries can use economic growth, they can use uh, taxation, they can use uh, increased allocation to health to fund the health workforce. And, and we are at, at WHO, as uh, doc, um, uh, Dr. Yamamoto told us, we, uh, we can really uh, help. And I would, I would really also add that the best way today um, to mobilize money for health workers is to invest in training. We have talked a lot during these three days about the global shortage. We live in a world where money is chasing health workers. There is much more money out there than there are actually health workers to respond to that, to that money. So the way to mobilize money is actually to train health workers yesterday. We should have started yesterday. Okay, we're going to start tomorrow. This is the first thing. And where donors can help is really start investing in pre-service training. And, and we know they haven't done it. You were saying they haven't done it at all. They've really funded a lot of, uh, a lot of commodities. They've funded a lot of refresher training, but they've not invested in pre-service training. The World Bank has not invested in pre-service training. This is what needs to happen. And once we will have health workers, they will be the best advocate for mobilizing both private and public money. They will be the ones, they will be you driving the agenda. And that's, that's really my, uh, my, my last word is invest in pre-service training, both from domestic sources and from international sources. Thank you. <coughs> Thank you, Agnes. Now, the final round to the panel. You've heard a lot of different suggestions for taking this agenda further. You heard that a lot is already moving, so we're not starting from zero, like what was said in the front row. This is really an agenda that is moving on. You heard a lot of very, very good and critical comments from the floor um, about different stakeholder arrangements, different power shifts, um, different investment focus. Um, so I, I would like to give you the last round of quick comments on where you now, after this little discussion, say, well, for me, the future lies there. Dr. Okay. Yamamoto. Thank you. I just would like to say quickly three points. Uh, I listen very carefully about the whole comments and also, but I should say that uh, national, at the national level or international level, we need uh, some resource re reallocation from rich to poor. It's really needed that way to, you know, the resource uh, investment of health workers and achieve, achieving UHC. To do so, uh, the solidarity is very important work, and uh, the uh, dialogue with the uh, uh, global level and the community level, regional level, is very crucial. Uh, that we have to continue to do this. The second point is uh, uh, we need more research and we need more. Um, Evidence, the uh, you know how how do we could uh, improve the productivity of our investment? How to use our money more efficiently and effectively? So we really need to you know uh, accumulate our experiences to, to 
to find it. And the final comment is that really uh, feels the same feeling that Port Portugal doctors say that I was uh, working in a community based uh, health workers. Uh, I really feel frustration of, of how our <coughs> national policy is doing, you know, what's stupid doing there, the, the uh, politicians and so on. So, so, but in that case, the networking and information sharing and also empowerment of the community people, as I said, and push our government. Uh, push the global community to improve uh, their behavior or uh, to move, move ahead to the UHC. So I, I got a lot of uh, power from all of you. Thank you. Thank, thank you so much. Actually, your point two and your point three. So research a little bit more how, so you do research on how you can shift the locus of decision making closer to where the work is actually being done. Yeah. I think that is an, would be an interesting uh, venue to pursue. Um, Dr. Nall. Sure. Um, well, actually, it's interesting, again, just hearing the comments, because it reminds me of the whole parable of the blind men and the elephant, where depending on where you're, where you're positioned, you pick one thing, and that is the cru most crucial thing. But obviously, none of us have the, the simple answer, the simple solution. And uh, I mean, we haven't really talked about the, the other players at the country level who can obviously help in this issue of human resource, um, HRH development. Um, contrary to what some people may think, USAID, through its investments in um, youth empowerment, through its investments in education, through its investments in other, other parts of, of the sectors and, and countries where we have a presence, um, all that potentially can contribute to this. I mean, just to remind people that there are 70 million unemployed youths at this point in time, 165 million youth living in poverty. Um, there's a, and so on the demand side, we have a huge demand to how are we going to get these 18 million health workers that are going to be needed um, based on WHO estimates to reach these 2030 goals. On the other side, we have a lot of, um, on the supply side, a lot of youth who are there and who can and are willing um, to move forward. USAID has some experience working with countries to, on youth empowerment and, and working with the private, private sector. The private sector will be a player and should be a player in this because they have the capacity on training and on employment to deploy, help deploy these youth at different levels. So again, we're not ta only talking about um, clinicians and nurses. There's a whole other cadre of folks that need to be trained to support the health system. Um, so I'll just stop there. I think we're sometimes missing the boat. We're still sort of thinking in silos. And I think I, I agree with uh, the comments that really we're all still in learning mode, but we need to be willing to learn and to open ourselves to what's going on and working with local leaders at the community level and also at the national level to be able to respond effectively to that. But we really don't have the, I mean, I hope that the, the, the next forum um, we'll be able to report on more rapid progress on this because, frankly, I think many of us go to too many meetings and discuss the same things, but the exciting thing is when you go to countries like Uganda or Guinea and you actually see things moving ahead to, despite what sometimes seems to be a bit of stagnation. I think very closely related to what you say, there, there is actually in the last few days was absolutely fantastic interconnection between different uh, fields and everybody would agree with your point that all the silo thinking is, is very unproductive too. So I think there probably the large part of the whole will agree completely. Um, Dr. Diallo, for you the same thing. I mean, you heard a lot of things from the floor and you also heard that efficiency gains might still also be um, achieved at country level um, and that a lot of um, the creative thinking, also the solidarity mechanisms um, might also be out there to, to create new forms beyond what you're already doing. So what did you pick up from these comments? Well, absolutely. I, I, I think from my perspective there are three key, point, um, three key points to, to take away from this. The first one being once again really invest in health and there's no health without human resources. So really invest in human resources and invest where you're likely to make a difference. Once again, invest um, to community-based interventions. So invest in human resources in health really at the local level at the community base. That's number one. Number two, and we heard several comments that go um, 
uh, in, in the same direction here. Um, I like the last comment that was made here. Partners are, are, are supporting accompanying countries a lot, but when it comes to human resources, typically partners do not invest in, in pre-service training, and partners are not going to come in and recruit human resources and place them and pay their salaries. I mean, you could do that to, to, to pilot a project or a program to launch it, but at the end, to sustain it, local governments really have to step up to cover that part. So that's the, the, the second uh, point here. And the third one is the concept of local administration. I mean, in Guinea, it's really big. Decentralization is big. From my perspective, shift the, the decision-making um, point to the local communities, empower them to take on um, their responsibilities. Uh, one thing that I wanted to, 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 to bring in here, the rural pipeline thing that I talked about here, uh, the, one key component of it is that, that the community has to be involved in that process because those people are supposed to be serving them. They have to be part of the decision making. They have to be, to be part of the implementation process, take on their own responsibilities. Okay, thank you very much. And finally, I thank you very much. I think the comments from the, from the audience has been very interesting. I picked about three, two or three of them. Uh, I want to start with one which uh, was very close to my heart, and that is training of the staff, healthcare staff. I'll give you just a very quick uh, uh, story. It was until my wife had a complication where she needed a specialized operation. It took a lot to be done in Uganda. I had to fly her out of the country to receive that specialized operation. And it dawned on me that you see, sometimes at the political level, or oh, working in Ministry of Finance, when we are budgeting for, for various sectors, health was not it's important, but it's not that very important, especially when it comes to training. So when the health Ministry of Health was asked for more money for training of the staff, it never dawned on me that such a thing could happen to me as an individual. So after coming from, <laughs> so after coming from that operation outside the country, I told my colleagues I'm going to be a crusader to fight for doctors' rights, doctors' training, doctors' everything. So you cannot be assured now, at the highest level, at least in Uganda, in Ministry of Finance, uh, we are going to, to make sure that the doctors are trained, we provide the facilities, both at, at that level and also community level. Two, the other issue is participation of the community. We had had challenges in Uganda in terms of distribution of, of, uh, of medicines. What we did to improve efficiency is that as soon as medicines are delivered at the local health clinic or hospital, messages are sent to local leaders, political leaders that <coughs> medicines are there. And therefore this issue of medicines not being available for one reason or another does not arise. And the community gets to know actually that there is medicine at the, at the, at the hospital. So that is one of the ways by which we are improving efficiency in the, in the, in the health, uh, health sector. Now, there was a suggestion about community participation. What we have started in some parts of the country, communities have started putting up health centers for themselves. They make the bricks, they mobilize the resources, they use their labor to put up the structure and tell the government now we have a structure here, could you take it over, provide medicine, provide personnel. So I think community participation is very, very important, but particularly when you're looking at the primary health care uh, 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 sub, uh, services. So that's what has also been happening in the country, where we involve the community in trying to address some of the gaps that we find in, in financing for, for health care. But otherwise, uh, uh, I, I think going forward, yes, uh, I always say in my concluding remarks that you see, there's a lot of money to go around. The question is how do you prioritize it uh, to be able to address the gaps that we find, especially in the delivery of the health uh, healthcare to our people. Thank you. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, we're coming to the close of this panel. Um, I was thinking a little bit yesterday, we were talking a lot about 
Um, we're in the political economy of health in these discussions. And in that political economy of health, a lot is shifting. A lot of powers are shifting, a lot of senses of who should be responsible are shifting, um, a lot of senses about how, the, how health links to the wider domain of financing, public or private. Um, and also, I think time is up to accept certain levels of inefficiency, uh, maluse of, 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 of finance, um, and, and fragmentation um, that might be imposed uh, for whatever reason. So I think this is a very important panel because what we heard is that here are open officials and at the same time a lot of critical um, thinkers in this forum. And this harks back to what was said uh, earlier by uh, Mr. Rudiger Kresch that um, this forum has been vital in getting people to talk and talk collectively and globally uh, and, and developing instruments, mechanisms and creative solutions together. So I hope you also found that there was some in uh, this panel for you. I want to thank our speakers, Dr. Yamamoto, Dr. Nalen, Dr. Diallo and Dr. Aduri. And I want to thank you all for um, having part, uh, been part of this panel. Now, after the break, we'll have the final, yes, applause. I think that's first, first of all. Thank you. <laughs> thank you very much. Uh, after the break, we'll have the, the festive um, acceptance of the Declaration of Dublin. Now, you can quickly study what is going to be presented over the coffee break, um, but I'd like to welcome you back a little after 11 o'clock. So let's say 11 o'clock because the minister is going to come and speak. So we'd like you to be back in the hall at 11.